my mates and then just people in powerlifting who probably take up a big part of my feed. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, I don't really spend heaps of time on socials apart from my posts and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, because a lot of it's just like get the work done and, and get some sleep in because otherwise I don't perform as well. So yeah, exactly. So just got to prioritize that and I'm eating a lot too. So Yeah. How like, much are you eating? It's come down now, but it got up to about, it got up to a thousand carbs, got up to 5,500 cows, 6,000 cows. A thousand carbs? Yeah. A thousand <laughs> grams. It's a joke. Eh? <laughs> Joke. What do you mean a thousand yeah, carbs? I think thousand grams of carbs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's when I go up to hundred kilos. Cause that's about like hundred kilos is like about probably ten kilos above where I comfortably sit if I was right. like, like eating intuitively. Yeah. yeah. So it's such a force feed, man. Wow. Oh my god. Um. Okay. Well. Um. Yeah. Let's get into it. Let's do it. Um. I just do a little entry for the vlog too. Yeah, dude. <laughs> How's your YouTube? Not doing as much on it at the moment. I think I'd like to, if I, like YouTube's one of those things you gotta be very consistent with. Oh yeah. So I was sort of like, I gave it a bit of a crack and I enjoyed it, um, but just not really where I have the time or money to send resources, I guess, right yeah. now. That's not really my focus. Yeah. Um, but I'd love to get more informative stuff, more for my clients than anything down the track, I think. Um, I see a lot of good coaches who have like good exercise libraries there with like great explanations of how they want certain exercise performed, particularly like accessory moves. Yeah. Because uh, in powerlifting, it becomes awfully specific how people do things. Mm. And if you're looking at online clients, like they'll send me squat, bench, and deadlift, but not their accessory moves, which might be done like shit. Yeah. So I'd like to get that done. Yeah. That's definitely something I like to do. Um, so less for the following on socials, like on YouTube, more for the client service. Yeah. That's more value. it. Value. And you probably find people will follow it anyways, so you know. Exactly. So, because it's free value for them, so. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of what the Palatine community is. Like, there's guys here, you might have heard of Melbourne Strength Culture, who yeah. are a gym here, and they have a great YouTube channel, which everyone everyone follows. And then, as soon as they started doing workshops, which were obviously paid, uh, they filled out because they had a big following of people who had followed their... Um, their um, their stuff on YouTube that was free for so long. So yeah. that's kind of a good culture. Yeah, that's yeah. all about the um, Gary V. I've been fucking, you know who he is? Yeah, I know Gary, yeah. Yeah, he's fucking nutcase mm. too. Um, he's a and he's all about like value, 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 value. Yeah, just keep content, putting it out content, content, there. Content, just content. consistent content, yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Uh, just met Maddie. already talking about Gary V. Yeah, we're into it. <laughs> <laughs> um, he made it. Hopefully no one comes into this lecture theory yeah, theater that we mm. hijacked. Um, and I'm very loud. So just stand up very staunch. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're doing a project, a school project. Yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah. We'll, um, we'll get into things. I have like tons of questions. We've only got an hour, so we'll, we'll get into it. Pump it. Pump it. Okay. Professional. I don't even have a name for the podcast. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, Let's see. the welcome to the Mitch Ping experience. Maybe if I go Ooh. with it, Mitch Ping Mind, something like that. Here with the very handsome Maddie B. Oh, too kind. He's even more good looking in person, <laughs> <laughs> and he is. He, he's coming up to a huge competition, probably mm. the biggest of your life. Would you say? Yeah, I'd say so. It's yeah. it's um it's one of those things where in a calendar for a powerlifter, there's definitely uh, their country's nationals, which is yeah. a big one for them, and then probably the only ones that will surpass that are the international competitions, yep. um, of which I'm seeking to do one later in the year. So for that would one? be uh, Oceanas, which is in Hong Kong, and I have done okay. an Oceanas before, but I, uh, it was in Singapore. But I was as a junior lifter. Yeah. And if you think about uh, juniors and opens and masters, it's kind of like rugby. If any of you follow rugby, it's like Colts and opens. Colts is kind Sounds of cool scary. And, and fun. Colts is the, the, the younger guys pretty much and not a lot of people come to watch and then you go to opens and it's first grade and you know the big crowds and that kind of thing. That's kind of opens in powerlifting as well. So definitely a more important and, and bigger competition to be at open nationals than say junior nationals right. with the younger guys. So yeah, open nationals is, is the one coming up in about four weeks. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Things, things are getting serious. <laughs> yeah. how's, the, how's the prep been? Oh, the prep's been cool. Um, it's been a very different prep to past ones and probably the one that I would like to continue living out in future. So in the past, being relatively new to powerlifting, I'm a bit of a baby in powerlifting despite having been doing it for a few years. The guys who are better and more experienced have been doing it for more like 10 to 15 years. Wow. Um, 
So in my really early time in powerlifting, we really jam-packed competition frequency in. So I was doing comps three, four, five, six times in a 12-month period, wow. which is really, really frequent. Okay. Didn't even really leave enough time for a proper comp prep, but the idea was exposure to competition, make mistakes, screw up, improve, become more mature as a lifter, and we got that outcome. Uh, and then once we sort of felt we'd achieved that, we, you know, spent a longer between competitions prepping properly and taking it to the nth degree on all on all sides of things so this is the first prep where we've really really done that and squeezed the sponge so to speak so my last comp will have been nine months ago yep compared to like six within a 12 month period right wow. so the frequency has really dropped away uh and what that's been the reason that's been so fun and so enjoyable is that I've been able to really target a sturdy bodybuilding phase and get back to sort of my training roots and do a okay. lot of bodybuilding training. You like that? I do enjoy bodybuilding yeah. training for a period, you yeah. know, like I wouldn't enjoy doing it for two years, but six months of it was really, really fun. Um, so I also get coached as much as I get coached by Andrew Tang in powerlifting. Uh, Dean McKillop coaches me in my nutrition, who's a really okay. great bodybuilder. And so he advised a lot of the modalities for us to use in our bodybuilding season, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and it was really fun. Like I was in the logbook doing a lot of like high RPE training, very close to failure. Uh, and that's sort of the training I started on when yeah. I first started the gym. It was just how hard can I go? How much can it hurt kind of thing? But now it's a little more calculated. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's been sort of half the off season, so to speak. Uh, and then the back end of prep, the last three months has been back into squats, bench and, dead, and, and, and deadlifts. Um, back into higher intensity work, back into higher frequency of the three lifts. Um, and that's kind of how the nine months has gone. But all in all, the success of the off season has been massive. Like yeah. I've never been bigger or stronger. Big um, I'm doing lifts I actually didn't think I'd be doing, yeah. uh, to be honest, in this prep. Yeah. I've really surprised myself, which is always okay. nice. Um, and did Tang like, you know, yeah, I knew you were gonna hit that. Is he? And Tang's, like, Tang's a bit like that, yeah. yeah. So before I met Tang, it was always sort of a case where I'd be making these ambitious goals that people would often say, oh, are you sure you're going to hit that? Oh, no. Whereas with Tang, it's very much a, I'll say, hey, yeah, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to squat 250. And he'd be like, oh, that's cute, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> Almost as if like- That's a good warm up. You're really holding yourself back. Yeah. But that's been the best thing for me is I've had someone who's had bigger goals for me than I've had yeah, for me. Yeah, that's which big, is, isn't Which it? is new for me. It's yeah. new for me, but it's also- um, it's pushed me pretty hard because I always look to please him, you know, yeah. in terms of you know his his coaching standards, um, because I have a lot of respect for him. So yeah. Yeah. Wow. What were those mistakes that you mentioned doing the high frequency competition, like yep. in terms of more food or programming peak week? Like what what kind of stuff did you did you learn? Yeah. The the, the mistakes came in in many shapes and, and sizes. Uh, some of them were on comp day, uh, and that's where a lot of them were we were seeking to learn would be simple things like uh, warm-up timing, which falls on the on the coach and, and the athlete, on um, preparation in terms of mindset, in terms of bringing all your gear, in terms of like, all these little teething things, right? Yeah. Um, even mistakes like failing, you know, and dealing with failure and then being able to actually push through the rest of the competition. Yeah. Um, I remember at, at our Oceanas in Singapore, I actually missed my second squat on depth, wow. um, which was a spanner in the works, because I traveled to Singapore. And then the decision is, do you go up or do you retake the same yeah. lift? And we retook the same okay. lift um, because that's what you're taught to do. That's a general rule. And got it, which was great. Um, and you know, on review, the video, I'd, I'd, I thought I'd hit depth, um, but it's always up to the refs and you respect that. Yeah. Um, but there's one of those things, like it happens and you experience it and yeah. now if it happens again, you know what you'd do. Yeah. Um, so those are more so the mistakes we were seeking to learn off rather than necessarily like peak week mistakes. However, we've definitely learned a lot about how or what best training methods, uh, what training methods I thrive on best going into competition. Uh, and what we've realized is a much longer span of time at the really top end of intensity is very useful for me. And it's a fine balance between taking it too far, which some lifters do, and they'll lift very heavy and not really taper because they're nervous uh, that they haven't hit that weight recently and right. mentally they're not right, sure. Right, right. That's not the right way to go in my opinion, but we we balance towards that side of things now because my exposure to the top end does help me a lot from a skill standpoint. Whereas a lot of lifters and a lot of coaches will spend just a brief moment in that really top end intensity right before comp, overreach and then taper but we'll actually undulate in and out of that top end intensity okay. quite a lot. So over the sort of last 12 weeks, we've done that quite a bit, yeah. sort of up, and you just deloaded, did that like 
yesterday. Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. Exactly right. And and that's that's been a unique case in itself. Uh, that deadlifts are, are probably my least technically proficient lift of the three, despite how it might look from the outside. Um, I'm most confident with squats and bench press and deadlifts. I'm pretty good at, but I've got a lot of work to do right. compared to the other two. Okay. So actually spending time at the top end, which again is a little bit unconventional because fatigue and because will you recover and all these things. Um, but the reality is I've been through such a gruesome off season that a couple of sessions at the top end really don't derail me. Yeah. You know? So I'm actually able to cope with those. And again, on that same note, not all lifters can cope with that. So yeah, you shouldn't yeah, do that. Yeah. So it's about trial and error and actually going and pushing a lifter or not and actually taking notes mentally or physically and having a, a bank of ideas behind you when you go into your next prep. So purely the amount of preps you do should improve your method. Yeah. If it doesn't, you're probably not being observant enough. And so for us having done seven, eight, nine, ten 10 comps within two years, hopefully we're in a good position to, to put together a good peak you know, yeah. in four weeks. Yeah. Yeah. That's the idea anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Is it scary going from juniors to opens? Um, like what's the, what's the, the jump like? Well, last year, last year was probably the scary part because I went to open nationals as a junior. Yeah. <laughs> so I actually went there as a, like, so I competed at junior Nats and then three months later I competed at open Nats. Yeah. Um, and that was a bit intimidating a little bit. Um, there were guys who I had watched for, for a long time and admired and thought, oh, it would be cool to be up there one day. Yeah. And all of a sudden it was there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, pardon me. That was definitely mentally challenging, but I think the biggest growth I've experienced over the last 12 months has been that mental side of things. Yeah. Um, I've been through a couple of pretty rough comps where I've gone six for nine or something like that, okay. which is a is a failure of a day, really. Like right. if you're going six from nine, you've like done you something get six really wrong. Out yeah, of nine. yeah, you fell okay. three of them. So, and that's happened on two occasions, um, and that's brought with it a plethora of lessons. But mentally too, because that can be quite mentally damaging for a lifter like myself who has a lot of passion behind the lifting. Okay. And who has a lot of probably probably a little bit of identity association with the success of their comps. Oh, of course, yeah. You know? um, so I had to do a lot of work on my personal mindset and the approach to lifting, and went through a phase where I had a little bit of just like that subtle sort of performance anxiety in lifting and training, and had to work a lot through that. So. That was more my challenge and the, the comps I go to, you know, having been overseas to Oshis and stuff like that, again, the exposure means that on comp day, I'm probably the most relaxed. Okay. I'm probably the probably, most you know, stressed the work's done. in training yeah. uh, in the heaviest weeks. But again, to compare previous preps to this one, like as an example, the other night's 285 deadlift that I did, the most chilled I've ever done it. And that <laughs> was the part I was most happy about yeah. was that I was able to execute what, what's my equal max um, under just the most relaxed, like low heart rate conditions. Like right. normally I'll put that sort of weight on the bar and the heart rate just spikes and the arousal comes up and I'm, I'm like going at it. Yeah. And um, Tang and I have spoken about how that might be part of what gets in the way technically is a little bit of over arousal. Mm, yeah. And so I've consciously worked on bringing it down and um, I was just so happy with how that went uh, considering that factor. Yeah. So that's been a big work in progress for me has been the mental attitude and the approach and like level of arousal and like how hyped you get before you lift and like what do you do like these are things that lifters should continue to assess and yeah. unless they're seeing continued success um yeah it's a very interesting component that not everybody thinks about and it's actually really really important yeah yeah so it's yeah i've heard that where you put your like in your workout diary like how crazy like hyped up you're getting or totally if you're you doing do that, the yeah. smelling salts i said to some because I, I went through like a phase where i was into this do you ever do the smelling salts i've used them a couple of times they're not, they're not my vibe <laughs> yeah. um I've, I've i've done the back slaps i've done the, yeah. the, the smelling salts and all the rest of it but i think that the more you can control your own arousal mm. internally yeah the more control you have over your performance because yeah. um there's some guys who preach and and swear by the the salts and the slaps and Everything, that's great. I believe that's a phase for that particular person. Yeah. And perhaps, I know for me, I would associate a little bit of fear or doubt in in that particular lift at comp if I was seeking the salts or seeking the slaps yeah. that I maybe didn't normally get in training. Yeah, That's that's how I felt. I was definitely a bit like, oh shit, I need something here to kind of help me. Um, even though that's not everybody's mindset with it. 
Uh, it's more of a, you know, there's perhaps some scientific reason that they actually enjoy using it or an anecdotal reason that they consistently expose themselves to in training. Like perhaps every time they do a top single, they're getting a slap on the back, mm. you know? Uh, and that makes sense if they're going to do that in competition as well. Um, but I'd definitely be careful uh, how much in control you are of your arousal levels and knowing that that does tie into performance. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, a really big thing, especially for just sort of normal gym goers yeah. who may be listening to this is if you need a pre-workout, if you need music, if you need your lifting partner, then you probably should do like a phase without it. Like come off oh. your pre-workouts, come off. <laughs> I have been <laughs> through that many phases of crutching on things like that. Yeah. I remember when I thought I needed a Gatorade. <laughs> Dude, like, talk to Tang about this. I, I legit was like, I think he rocked up to a session and I was like, bro, they had, they had no Gatorades at, um, at the server. He's like, yeah, that's cool, man. I'm like, bro, like, man, I've had a Gatorade every session this block. He's like, all right, don't worry about it. And I was like, I was like, bro, like, I haven't had a Gatorade. <laughs> and like, now that I look back on it, it's laughable. But yeah. you go through these phases where you think, like, all I was thinking to myself was, oh yeah, I'm getting some quick, quick, you know, sugars in the bloodstream, you know, all these things that are totally illogical. And I could have said to you off air, I've been eating up to a thousand grams of carbs yeah. a day. But I, but I thought to myself, oh, I need that, that yeah. thirty, that thirty before training, like, <laughs> and like, you know, all these things, all these things happen, and you know, you wear, you wear the special socks or you wear the special this, and that's okay, like. Top end athletes tend to have these little things. Mm, like yeah. you look at the Roger Federer's of the world, who set up their drink bottle in a certain kind of way, or the Nadal's, you know, who go off at the ball boy for changing yeah. their bottle. These are the things <laughs> that do occur because I think the top end athletes are a little bit on that uh, side of things mentally. You know, they're a little bit um, particular with the way they set up things, and you know, a little bit OCD, a little bit all these things, and that's okay. But understanding that that's a choice and a preference than a necessity is important yeah. you know because if there is that day where you can't get that Gatorade you're probably going to be fine you know yeah. um, and I've revealed this to myself time and time again which has helped me to mature as an athlete um, for example I was in Cairns over the weekend coaching um, probably not getting quite as much sleep probably not eating quite as well as I might at home had two excellent sessions yeah. excellent sessions purely as a result of environment and being around friends you know so there's a bunch of things which uh are probably less impactful than, than, than you think they are. Yeah. Like those little things like Gatorade and whatever. Uh, I'm hitting this brand all day. Uh, <laughs> and there's things that are probably more impactful than you think they are, like environment. Yeah. You know, and friends and that sort of thing. Like I would say like that training buddy thing you mentioned, like that's something which, yeah, sure, spend some time by yourself, yada, yada. But that's the kind of thing which can genuinely improve your session. Oh, if you're in a good mood, yeah. if you're in a good mood being supported, that is so much better than having like a great pre-workout yeah you know what i mean yeah so yeah that's that's my opinion on that yeah, that's anyways. why yeah. our um industry is always going to be thriving like the pt one-on-one -on -one coaching course, thing course, like absolutely it's absolutely. that one-on-one -on -one connection yeah that yeah and i think and i think social is like being social is what like most human beings seek even yeah. if they're looking to lift exactly um which is why for me with my work i tend to run more semi-private group based stuff that's not like group training. It's like yeah. everyone's coming in with their own program and I'm still coaching everyone. Oh, that's but, cool. But How do you do that? Well, we spend about an hour and a half together. Okay. And between two and five lifters come in at the one time. They'll run through their warm-ups. I'm there with everyone, making sure everyone's doing their warm-ups correctly. Uh, and then because powerlifting has slightly longer rest times, it means that I can watch a working set over here. And then once they're done, they'll hang out or chat to someone and I'll move on to the next person and it kind of runs in that cyclical nature where I'm, right. I'm bouncing and I'm I'm probably at my peak coaching uh, time in terms of like my ideas and my flow because I'm seeing everyone um, versus the PT which is like do your set and then talk about life like yeah. in between which is cool and like I've been through session, yeah. and, I've, and, I've, and I've been through that phase where I've done a lot of PTs and I do enjoy doing PT sessions but I tend to limit it to like the first two to four weeks of a client's journey with me and then they're in with the group because I like to make someone as autonomous as possible uh, in that first two to four weeks teach them a lot of the tools and the skills so that when they come to the group, which is a much cheaper option in my business oh, yeah. model, um, then they've got a much longer um, tenure as well because they're able to afford it. They're with friends. They're still getting the coaching service. Uh, it's a good mix. Um, yeah. So that's the way I like to do things. And I think that that's the way, like when I'm here with Tang, yeah. that's the way I do things with him too. Okay. I go to his gym. His lifters are all there training. He's there. 
everybody's training together. It's a good time. Everyone's spotting, you know, everyone's loading each other's plates. And that's powerlifting, you know? Yeah. So I think that one-on-one is not powerlifting to me. Like, yeah. some people need that for X amount of time. But if you're getting one-on-one coaching as a powerlifter for six months, there's something wrong, in my opinion. Unless that coach doesn't have a model to do group stuff, uh, it means that you're probably just coming in, having a chat, and they're loading your plates. Right. Because you can learn, I think, the big rocks of what you need to know within the first couple of months. I've experienced and I've done it for lifters. Uh, beyond that, um, I don't feel good about charging someone that kind of money, which PT is a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, especially to my demographic, which is usually 20 to 27 year olds mm-hmm. who probably don't have money flowing out of their pockets. I've got a couple of masters lifters who come in and do consistent PTs, but these are old women who yeah. need help, like yeah. loading the plates and like forget the cue I told them last week. like. That's a different demographic. Okay. So I think for young people, definitely seeking or working with a coach, or if you are a coach, encouraging your lifters and your clients to become a level of autonomous that maybe isn't fully autonomous, but is towards that point that they know what's going on. They understand programming. They understand prehab work. Uh, they get the technical side of things, but they need your eyes still. Like yeah. That's where you want to get someone to, I think. That, yeah, that's such a good transition into how you run like your community and how yeah. big yeah. having a community and, is. And, that, and, that, and that's how one day, like, I mean, I'm not thinking about this in the near future, but it's like, if I one day wanted to have a gym, mm. like... Do you want to have a gym? Well, I think that it's on the radar for a maybe, like a yeah. one day thing. Yeah. I don't crave that right now as a 23 year old. I'm more looking at like property and stuff like that, more so as my kind of staple to try and, you know, solidify my next 10 years financially. Um, and after that, I think with comfort, I'd look to open a facility perhaps. It's definitely not something on my mind is like that's going to happen, but yeah. it's like that'd be cool. Um, it's extremely circumstantial. Like, where are you living? Uh, would you do it with anyone? Uh, what sort of community are you currently amongst? Are you happy, unhappy? Like, I think if you're a PT or a coach in a gym that you're happy with the community oh, and happy yeah. with the environment, yeah. it's a little bit a miss to just go, I'm going to open a gym, you know? Unless you've got this totally different vision you're after mm. and, and you want to create, you might as well reinforce the vision of the gym or facility you're already in, um, in my opinion anyways. Yeah. It depends on your situation. Okay, so yeah. what, uh, where is your passion? Is it in the one-on-one, not the one-on-one, but like coaching face-to-face. people? The face-to-face. 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. I love that I get people reaching out to me on uh, social media or email or whatever for coaching online. Like yeah. that's really flattering yeah. because it means that they would rather have an online coach in me yeah. than find a face-to-face coach in their own country. You know, yeah, like that's flattering to me because the value of your coaching is definitely going to come down on an online capacity. Like okay. no matter how hard you try, I yeah. believe that's the case because you can't be there with the person, mm. hands down. Yeah, there's things you can't show them. There's things you can't explain to them. Yeah, um, there's the you you can't be online. Like there's like I don't know you as well as this talking to you online. That's just a fact. Yeah, you can have as many Skype calls as you want. Yeah, like, it's just not the same. And you can't do a like okay, how'd your deadlifts go today? Send me the videos. It's already too late. That's it. It, it comes to a point where the athlete has to behave differently because you're an online coach. They have yeah. to send you the videos and they have to wait for a delayed feedback, Yeah. Um, which is fine. It works out cool. Like I do it with my coach. It's all good. Um, but you've got to understand as a lifter that if you're seeking that out, it is different. So I love that because I, get a, I, I usually get a very particular type of client come to me from online. It's rare that someone comes to me online who's, how to put it, like uh, a flimsy client who won't be here in six months. Yeah. Most of my clients have okay. very long tenure with me because they see what my values are like through online, through social media. Uh, some of them miss, like totally miss that and don't really follow me for too long before they inquire, which is why I have a pretty like robust questionnaire process okay. where I really seek out how much they know about me okay, yeah. and how much they love training. Yeah. Because if someone wants to do online coaching with me and they don't love training, it's going to be a headache. Yeah. It's going to be a headache yeah. because the last thing I need to do is be mummying someone who's not at training. Yeah. That's not my job. Exactly. I hate that. Yeah. It grinds my gears because I would be at the gym unless I'm in, on my deathbed. Yeah. So if someone says to me, oh, I've got the sniffles, not going to the gym. Oh, I just <laughs> cannot, I, I just cannot deal with the mindset. Yeah. Like if you're sick and you cannot go to the gym, I understand that. Yeah. But if someone's making a choice because to be frank, they're being a bit of a bitch about it, like that is not what I like to work with. Like yeah. I'm not there to coach someone in life how to go to the gym that's just not like where I'm at like yeah. I did that for a phase when I was more of a PT I was there to motivate someone to be at the gym that was kind of my job whereas now as a coach 
I'm an information giver who's progressing lifters and people who love what they do and want to be the best. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, if someone's in my team and they don't want to be their best at least, if not the best, like, I don't get that. Okay. You know, I'd rather someone with a similar mindset to me who goes, I'm in this to be, to actually search my potential, mm -hmm. genuine potential, and in doing that, try to be the best. Yeah. That's cool. Okay. I love that. Yeah. So, how did you transition from... Because you would have realized that like, oh, everyone's, people are canceling, there's no, motive. I have to motivate them and they're not coming, doing their own sessions. And you're like, okay, like this isn't working. I want to train powerlifters. Yep. Like how did you transition into that? That's a tough one. You have to, you have to sort of um, deal with the former for a while, mm. uh, solidify your name, your reputation, your client base, find the gold nuggets within, within the clients that are the ones you're looking for long term. It doesn't mean there's anything negative or it's not a horrible experience to deal with clients who need that babying, who need that sort of attention. Uh, it's more so that when you become a little more established, you should and can begin to uh, pick and choose the kind of people you want to work with. So the how is like, when I was more into PT, more at commercial gym sort of sort of environment, it was just taking whoever came in the door, helping them as best as I could, giving them the tools, and becoming a better PT and coach in the process. I hadn't actually earned by that point to be able to pick and choose anybody. Okay, yeah, yeah. It was a process of, okay, well, I'm kind of starting out. Yeah. They're kind of starting out. Let's just make it happen. And that was a really enjoyable time. And don't get me wrong, it isn't as if I didn't enjoy that or I wouldn't enjoy working with someone who needs a bit more attention. It's just, if I've got the choice, there's a definitely a particular client I love working with. And to know that as a coach or a PT, I think is very important. Yeah. Because you know what? The more you express that to your clients, the more they're, they will be that. Yeah. Because they know what your expectation is and they know what will get results. So if I've got someone who comes in who maybe has a tendency to miss sessions, but I make it very clear to them what I've just told you, yeah. it's unlikely they'll miss sessions. Yeah. Um, I've got a couple of rules within my team as well that pretty much would lead to someone being outed, okay. um, such as changing the program. Right. That's something which really triggers me as, an, as a coach because purely based on my outlook to my coach, you know, yeah. when I think about my coach, there's a lot of respect, there's a lot of trust, and or blind trust to the point that oh, he, yeah. he, he could tell me to do bloody handstands <laughs> and I would just get it done. And I would ask him maybe why, but I wouldn't ask him in a way that was like, but why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? That's such a big thing. And I would never in my wildest dreams change the program, <laughs> change numbers, because to me that just means that, that I don't think what he wrote down was best for me. Yeah. Whether I consciously think it or not, the action speaks. And so I've had lifters who have done that before, who have changed numbers very innocently because they felt good on the day. And that's cool. But I've had to make it very clear to them what it means to me and how it makes me feel, which is very upset mm. and offended because yeah. that's my career and I put so much time into my guys and their program and it's not just slapped together, it's yeah. thought through. Oh, like, everything's thought. And there's six weeks ahead that's thought through, 12 weeks a year, and their actions now that might be harmless or innocent might actually impact that. Um, or I might be looking to give them an opportunity to lift big in four weeks when they'll feel even better and they've totally screwed that up. Yeah. And they might not know that, but it's about educating them that they do. Mm. And then I go, right, that's kind of a strike. And if you do that again, that's why I can't coach you. Okay. So, now so you're really strict with them. Consciously, if yeah. you do that again, like I won't kick someone out from doing it first time. <laughs> but I say, look, if you do that again, this is how I feel about it. You know I feel this way now. You know you're going to offend me if you do that again. If you consciously go ahead and, and do that, then I can't coach you. Wow. That's my standard. Okay. Uh, and I've said that to people who are actually close friends of mine. And yeah. I've, I've, I've been coaching too. I've still said that to people that are friends of mine. I've said, look, this is just my standard. Yeah. I don't need that X dollars per week enough to not have my own values and standards. It's a waste of your time. Absolutely. And it actually degrades my quality of enjoyment or my enjoyment mm. in my work because I don't want the headache of thinking, oh, why, why, why? Because I'm a bit of an overthinker. Yeah. If a client does something that I'm thinking, oh, but does that mean they don't trust what I want them to do? Does that mean there's disrespect? I don't need to be thinking these things. You know, I want to work with people who understand that in that context, what coach says goes, you know, yeah. uh, I don't need to be that person in life. But as a coach, that makes sense oh, to yeah. me because that's yeah, how yeah. I treat my coach. Yeah. Um, and again, if someone doesn't want to do that, like find a coach who doesn't care. Yeah. You know, find a coach who uh, you change the program and they clap. Yeah. Because I won't clap, you know. <laughs> no. 
but <laughs> find someone because like I, I don't need to be that person mm. you know I'd rather uphold my own standards and people respect you for that as yeah. well and they'll seek you out because people want coach like that Yeah, they actually want that uh, slightly more authoritarian like this is what we're doing this is how it's done get it done Yeah, you know some people love that I love that Yeah, you know so you seek out the clients you want Okay. at the end of the day I think yeah, yeah. wow it, it, it's like going to uh, if you're sick and you just Google like, oh, what do I do to get sick? Oh, this, I need surgery. Oh, I'm going to do the surgery <laughs> my, myself. Yeah, like, yeah, no, yeah. you go to the hospital and you get a professional doctor Absolutely. to do it for you. And there's different grades. Like you, know, you talk doctors, one thing has a big magnitude there. You talk yeah. coaches, the magnitude's lower, sure. But exactly, yeah. at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, I've asked someone before who has changed the program. I've said hypothetically, so you just change the program that you pay for. Yeah. <laughs> Like, just think about that for a moment. <laughs> like, you're paying to write your own thing. Is this a thing? You know, I just go, I just, I just, I just scratch my head. Yeah. You know? And like what you just said there, like, I don't know, say you've got, you got in Australia, we've got healthcare. Yeah. And I say, yeah, you do your surgery at home and you yeah. get an infection. <laughs> and the doctor goes, why do you do surgery at home? You get an infection, you, you're probably going to die now. And then you go, oh, well, I just read on this article and just couldn't be bothered to go into the hospital. It's like, we've got free healthcare. Like, it just doesn't make sense. You know, you no, just, it doesn't you just, make you just, any sense you just, at all. You just scratch your head. Yeah. You know, but no, that's just my pretty strong opinion. Yeah, right? no, that's that's a great thing to have. And, and you're right, people will respect you yeah. for that. Some people won't, but that's okay. Like, I think that... Uh, They're not the clients that you would want to work yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, you know, and other coaches will do things differently. And yeah, I think as long as you, you're happy with the way you're doing things, that's the biggest priority yeah um, because that will mean you'll enjoy your time in the in the career choice yeah you know? that goes for all jobs man okay yeah, yeah definitely totally so who have been your greatest sort of coaches and mentors and things like that you, you work with like um, Tang and Dean and yep. um, some Kairos and physios yeah, yeah. They're, so they're you have definitely a up, team up, they're yeah. definitely up the top um, there's certainly some guys I've seen online such as like Bryce Lewis and, okay, yeah. and Eric Holmes and um, even um uh, Mike used to tell um, yeah. guys who are sort of cross between sort of the bodybuilding powerlifting realm uh, not obviously Bryce um, but more more, more locally and more sort of directly to me definitely Tang uh, definitely um, Dean McKillop definitely Nick Pappas from Balance Health yeah. chiropractor uh, and, and the rest of the team there you know James Rich as well um, and also Jacob Skeppers from JPS Health okay. JPS Health uh, in Melbourne here they've got two facilities and Jacob took me under his wing when I just started powerlifting coaching. And he, he does both bodybuilding and powerlifting coaching and competes in both himself too. Wow. Um, JPS is a yeah, pretty broad kind of spectrum service, um, but very, very good quality. And there's a little plug for you, bro. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but yeah, he took me under his wing and took me through a bit of a mentorship structure that he was looking to implement uh, with, a, with a bigger scale, longer term, and pretty much taught me a bunch of things uh, to do with powerlifting coaching and periodization okay, uh, wow. before he implemented that as a teaching sort of outside of, outside of him and I. Uh, I think he did that with a few different people, but I think he saw me as someone who was very passionate uh, young, uh, driven as a lifter, and you know had a lot to learn as a coach. And yeah, I'm very grateful for the work he did with me because that was a very close sort of relationship where he was having weekly calls with me and wow. teaching me, actually mentoring me. Uh, so that was really, really cool. Uh, and Tang, his mentorship's been a lot more natural where it's just been sort of like the coaching mentorship. I ask him questions all the time. I've experienced... Uh, you know, pr programming, uh, coaching directly, comp day coaching through him, you know, through experiencing yeah. as a lifter. Uh, and then when I look towards um, uh, Dean, of course, his um, nutritional uh, advice it ties in with a lot of training stuff as well. Okay. But being a well established coach, again, there's coaching skills that keep coming to the forefront and you see re emerge communication skills, management skills, leadership skills, all these things. Uh, and then last but not least, with Nick over at Balance. He's probably been the strongest, uh, um, if you call it life coach. Yeah. Uh, so there's a guy, his name's Tony, over there at Balance 2, who have both been really, really uh, strong role models for me in business, leadership, um, mindset. Um, and he's someone, Nick, who's a reference point for me weekly. When he's treating me and we're working on things from a movement standpoint, he's a soundboard for me as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm very lucky to have some really strong dudes. Um, all, all my mentors happen to be males, which is you know just coincidence, but the really, really strong guys around me who create a fantastic support web for oh, me definitely. whenever I need it. So yeah, I feel yeah. very fortunate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Do you think that's the best way you learn through that mentoring? Absolutely. One on one, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that it's great, all good and well to go and do courses and, and keep upskilling yourself. Mm. It's, it's a necessity. Um, but having, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate we don't have more of a system that encourages this yeah. in Australia it's right like now. It's like going to university, it's like what? Yeah, it's exactly. And for if, if, if more PTs and coaches were spending time with the best in the industry, which again, there aren't many mm. of the best, I guess, like compared to the amount of people entering the industry. Yeah. I heard some figure like 10,000 PTs enter the industry. Oh my God, year, yeah. 10,000 crazy. Leave. Yeah. Um, so with that, it's hard to manage. But I think, yeah, if you're a PT or coach out there, uh, look towards the, the gyms and the coaches who are successful and look if they have some kind of mentoring system. But that's like, again, is mentoring this system or is it something that happens naturally? Mm, yeah, I it hate that word. I ladder. hate that word, mentor. Yeah, like, it kind of like, sh- exactly. It should be the latter. It's more of just a teacher or someone who's there yeah. to help you when you need it, uh, an advice giver. Yeah. Um, mentoring has become a business model, definitely, which goes against the idea of mentoring. Yeah, they do like mentoring was like twenty people on a call. Yeah, and you listen to me. It's like that's not it's really exactly, and that's the thing. You got to be careful what you enter into and. Uh, again, I've been fortunate enough to deal with people who have just naturally been mentors. Mm. They haven't actually said, I'm your mentor. They're just naturally yeah, exactly right. mentoring <laughs> you as a coach, as a friend, or as a nutrition, or whatever, right? All these things occur and they just kind of happen. Yeah. Uh, and that's true mentoring. That's raw mentoring, you know? Yeah. Um, and I've been that for my lifters and, you know, people who have come to me and all that sort of thing. And I'm not going to charge them through the nose or charge them yeah, yeah. for that. That's just part of the process. Um, and if there was more of that, there'd be better coaches. Yeah. You know? And I heard like a good mentor learns just as much as the mentoree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No doubt about that. Um, I would be surprised if I had taught Tang that much about coaching or anatomy or anything, but I think when it comes to (laughs) other aspects, things like communication skills, um, you know, other aspects of coaching, which are arguably equally as important, there'd perhaps be some things he's learned from things I've said. Who knows? Yeah. You know, I haven't asked him, but I'd say there'd be a couple of things. And I think that from my own personal experience, I can definitely vouch for that, that you might be in that, like I say, that sort of authoritarian like coaching role where, you know, your job is to teach, your job is to kind of let someone know under your knowledge what the X, Y, and Z rule is for lifting or mm. for whatever. In that process... Often, because of the types of people that I work with, there's a, there's a good, solid, you know, intelligent conversation that spurs on from that, and I'll definitely learn something in that process which I hadn't thought about before or hadn't considered all the time. Yeah, I've had a lot of great conversations with my female lifters about um, them training with their cycle, how that impacts them from a hormonal standpoint, performance standpoint. Obviously, stuff that I'd have no idea. Oh, about I know, right? Outside of outside of research, which again is is limited beyond experience, right? Yeah. So when you're talking to females mm. about it versus talking or or hearing a male talk about science, yeah, it's so different. It's, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's important that we have those conversations, not just that topic, but ones that we aren't exposed to. Um, you can read about it, you can do whatever you want, but if you can talk to someone like horse's mouth scenario, that's always going to be better, in my yeah. opinion, or you know, uh, more insightful. Yeah. I love the saying, uh, one of the PTs I used to work with used to always say this, is I don't give any client a training that you wouldn't do yourself. It's like reading uh, all the books, watching all the videos on how to surf, but if you've never surfed, you're not going to be able to coach someone on how to surf. not a lot of credibility there, yeah. Yeah. And I think like, it's funny because it's common knowledge that we often see athletes who weren't the best Mm. be great coaches because or perhaps they were really good but they weren't like the top or elite because they didn't have the genetics for it or the natural knack for it um, and they end up coaching because they actually love the sport so much and they've worked on the development so much being that slight undergrade and work their way up, work their way up. Those are often the best coaches have had to really hustle and really look into all the possibilities to improve, you know, um, versus someone who's been a natural athlete mm. and then come and coach. They are not often the best coaches. Yeah. It's hard to find someone who's like a really, really top athlete and also excellent coach. Um, I think the things that have helped my coaching the most is struggling as an athlete, yeah. you know? Um, cause some people look at me and think that I'm this, you know, good powerlifter or whatever powerlifter in their opinion, 
but in the grand scheme of things, I'm doing well, but I'm not the best. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty good, but I'm not the best. I've had to work very hard, and I've got a lot more work to do. Yeah. Um, that's where I. What's that's that's that's, that's okay. what I think. Anyways, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, and that feeds into being a better coach. Yeah. You know? How do you, how do you balance being an athlete and coaching? Because the stronger you get, the more serious your competitions get. The more serious all your rehab, recovery, mm. working with all these people. Mm. How do you balance that? I think that exposure to all of those things that I foresee that I will require, such as uh, treatments and frequency of treatments, personal, like my, in my own time, prehab work or mm. rehab work, um, you know, how long sessions take, again, the mental apl- ap- application to, to training uh, and to comps. And the balance comes from probably, okay, p- probably loving coaching and training or competing equally, but half a percent more competing okay truly i love coaching so much yeah but i do I'm, I, I'm i am when it comes down to the wire i will take care of the comp the, the comp and the training and myself yeah which is not actually something a lot of coaches would say and not all year round yeah. so for example i'm taking a week off coaching right now to be here with my coach to take care of myself yeah which i think is very important yeah because my lifters see that and, and I've planned it so that in the season, there aren't a lot of comps going on for my lifters. There's none. So I've just come from Cairns where I've coached uh, Helen, my master's athlete. So I traveled to Cairns to coach her on my money. Um, wow. And coached her at nationals. She smashed it. She came second in the 58 class. Wow. It's her first nationals. And then there's no comps happening until after that. So I've planned that. And I've been allowed to step back from coaching and be selfish because I've been smart about it. Okay. And again, my lifters see, would see that. Respect I hope, it. I hope and yeah. go, okay, wow, that's commitment to his lifting. That's why I'm getting coached by him and that's how I should be. Yeah. That's kind of what I hope. Um, it's less of a like, this is more important to me. It's at the right time, I pull the trigger on this. You know, they're both like, they both always have 100% input, truly. Mm. Um, outside of that, I probably sacrifice more social time than anything. Yeah. Um, I've got to try really hard to like catch up with mates and try really hard to like go see mum and dad. Like yeah. I actually really do because I'm yeah. so focused on these two things. Um, but I think that's what it takes to be successful and that's all I want. Um, but when the time comes, I'm happy to slightly pull back on one mm. to push, to actually pull the trigger on the other and give 110. Yeah, You know what I mean? Um, so when I come back from nationals, naturally, the training demand will be a little bit lower. Uh, the focus... <clears throat> Per session will be a little bit lower. The time in training will be a little bit lower, and I've got big plans for my business yeah. to actually pull the trigger on that. Okay. And so timing's important, I think. Yeah. Um. And if I was trying to pull the trigger on both, I've tried and it doesn't work. Yeah. I've gone into comps, turning the heat up in work, and screwed my prep. Mm. And that doesn't make anybody happy because I'm not going to be a better coach for that. I'm not going to yeah. be a happy coach because I'm screwing my own prep up. You know and indirectly you might blame that you're doing too much work and that just brings a bad energy yeah so i think that the biggest thing has been balance how is a hard question to answer but doing it is a imperative like you have to balance them um and you have to be aware of if you are balancing them or if you aren't mm. uh, and that might be client feedback because i've had moments where clients have gone i'm not happy with the service yeah well you're not giving me what i want because I've pulled the trigger too hard on training mm. and I haven't been taking care of clients enough. And that's never been a long-term thing and something yeah. that's been continued. Wow. I think that all coaches make mistakes um, and it's never been conscious and they've mm. been aware of that. But that's another thing. Client and coach relationship and communication is so important and should help you People find that skills. balance. You know? um, even though what I said before about you know when it comes down to the wire, for, for me, like in my heart, I prefer like I'll, I'll take care of my lifting and that's what I love. Um, I will never consciously not take care of my guys. Mm. You know, like, yeah. even though that's true, what I said just then, first, I will tick that box that they're taken care of, even though I might be pulling the trigger on training. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's still always that care factor that I would never not take care of them consciously. Yeah. You know? But it's it's that subconscious that you, it actually gets you. Yeah. You know, you might not even realize it, which is where the communication comes in. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's like leading from the front where you're taking that time off for yourself because that's how committed you are and that's how committed you want your clients to be, which yeah. is huge. And sometimes my clients will go, oh, can we do a session this time? And I'm like, no, no, I have a block here. This is for my training. Like I'll, I'll show them my phone. They're like, oh, can we train here? I'm like, no, that's why I'm training. Yeah. And they're like, oh, we'll go. I'm like, if I prioritize you over my training, I'm setting a bad precedent. I'm saying to you, oh yeah, 
if you don't have time, don't yeah. prioritize it. You need to prioritize yeah, things. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing, you know, I think that, again, what you say, leading from the front, it's understanding that to be a great coach, you don't have to not care about yourself. Mm. Arguably, it's the opposite. That to be a fantastic coach and to be a happy coach and one that can lead from the front and set an example, you should be taking care of yourself the most you can. You know, you want to be coming into your sessions happy. You're feeling confident that you've done your session. You're ticking all your personal boxes. You're in a great mind frame. You're ready to take care of somebody else. You know what I mean? Because you're not taking care of yourself. It catch up to you. Oh yeah. Absolutely, it'll catch up to you. You know. So there's a balance. It's not about neglecting your clients. It's about being in the best shape to take care of them. Yes. That's the way I would look at it, right? I'm so glad you said that because yeah. it's if you're not in your if you're not getting eight hours of sleep, I know if I get less than eight hours of sleep and I'm giving a training session to someone, they're not getting their money's worth. Hundred percent. Yeah. One hundred percent. And you're better off doing ten percent less sessions with clients and then being fantastic. Yeah. Uh, than pushing the wire and being a walking zombie and oh, you haven't done your training, you haven't ticked your nutrition, you're just a sad sack, you're, that's all you're talking about, <laughs> yeah. you're not even focused on them, like all these things. If you come in and you're happy, oh, it, they will get the best out of yeah. it. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's not even about you, like when I said there, me caring more about lifting, it's like that needs to happen Yeah. to take care of them. Yeah. Otherwise you will not give your best. Yeah. Uh, that's, I genuinely believe that. Okay. Yeah. What, what other things do you do outside of lifting? Because I know you said you struggle to like, okay, I need to see my mates, I need to see my family. What kind of things do you like doing outside? Well, I do play the guitar. Okay. So I do a bit of that on the side. And, and I Where's enjoy... the Instagram videos of that? <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny thing, you know, like there's some stuff that's kept, kept private, I guess. Um, <laughs> Your girlfriend would not like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, probably not. Um, but yeah, you know, like for, for, for the most part, like I'm pretty simple in that regard. You know, if I wasn't living with my girlfriend, I'd, I'd want to find time to catch up with her, but I live with her. So yeah. that's a big tick in my life. Like, uh, to be honest, if I could work and lift and spend time with her, I'm, I'm happy. Yeah. Um, that was a bit cute. <laughs> um, but like I said, you know, uh, planning time that's back home with the family, very important to me. Yeah. Um, and spending time with Steph's family as well. Um, it, 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 these, it, these are the big rocks. Um, I, I love going to the beach. Uh, I do like to get away and go. We go to, um, my family used to go to a place on the coast called Scott's Head. Okay. Um, so I love the beach. Um, these are all little things I like to do outside of training and work. But if I'm honest, a uh, huge, huge portion of my time is spent doing those two things. Oh, um, yeah. and, and I'm actually okay with that because yeah. I, I do enjoy both those things so much, yeah. you know. Um, I get a lot of fulfillment from progress in my body with powerlifting. I always have. Uh, and I get a huge amount of fulfillment from uh, seeing my lifters succeed. Okay. Uh, that's a lot of, like, my box is ticked, yeah. you know. And then there's family time, girlfriend time. I'm yeah. like, I got my dog as well. So oh, cool. I got like a little like she's she's like having a dog to having a baby, dude. So like I got a staffy. Yeah. So she's needy, man. Crazy. Like, I, I take her everywhere. So like I literally take her everywhere. Go for your walks. Yeah. Yeah. So for the most part, it's like that's that that's my little world, and and that's why I've got to make sure that I make extra effort and extra time when it comes to my friends because I do care about my friends a lot, and sometimes I get lost in that whirlwind of work and training and fitting in family and girlfriend and, and dog and all these things mm. that two weeks go by and I haven't seen my best mate and we go oh shit you know and, and but he's busy too because we're like the same yeah. kind of person yeah, yeah. and we're all just whirlwinding in our own little life and then we're like oh shit we've got to catch up so that's the thing I've got to keep reminding myself is like you got to put energy into your friendships right you have mm. to oh, otherwise yeah. they, they, like, they, they won't all last like you live a couple of mates who you, you won't see for a year and it doesn't matter mm. but they aren't all like that yeah. and that's fine that's natural um, so that's something I've been working on lately if I'm honest is trying to put my hand out more with friends and spend more time and make time because that's the one thing that I, that I do lack is the awareness that yeah. perhaps those aren't getting the energy they need um, it's always a balance bro so, okay yeah. yeah who keeps you in check because I know there's times now like in prep you're not going to be like taking a weekend off like going off plan not training like that's this isn't the time no, to no, no. get off plan yeah. but when in your off season or if you're really hard on yourself mm. is Tang or Dean or one of your caros and, and things like that do they say okay look you need to take a deal or you need to like go for your yeah. walk you need to do yeah. I'd say I'd say the one who I have like the most formalized check-ins with mm. is Dean okay and he's been a great advice giver on, on stress management. Yeah, yeah. And he probably sees a lot more of my stress because uh, at, that, at that time of the week when I check in with him on a Thursday, I'm usually fucked up, like really? flustered <laughs> and like busy and like it's been a huge week and perhaps I'm a little bit tired and whatever and I've got 
all the stressful things at the forefront of my mind. I plump them onto a paper check-in with him, which is actually a really great thing to do. Mm. If you don't diarize, that's yes. a great thing to do as well. Tracking. And so he sees a lot of my stress when it does arise and he's always really great at bringing me back to square one or bringing me back to base and understanding what's important, what are my non-negotiables, that's one of his things. Okay. He's, he's very critical of PTs who overwork themselves yeah. because it's a conscious process. Yeah. He's like, have your non-negotiables, whether that be your eight hours sleep, whether that be your two to three slots in the day where you need to eat. Because for me, obviously, with the intake that I'm having, I can't go eight hours without eating, otherwise yeah. I won't meet my markets. Yeah. And that's stressful too, you know, getting the food in. And so yeah, Dean's probably been the one that more frequently has that level of like stress management advice. Mm. Uh, then it's like if it's lifting related I'm straight in touch with, with Tang and he's yeah. happy to jump onto a phone call and, and give me you know again that grounding sort of advice um, and then there's also Nick who's been very helpful again with the sort of mindset leadership side of things if I'm ever struggling with uh, life stuff that confuses me or business stuff that I'm unsure of he tends to have already been through that kind of wow, thing yeah. experience wise and so again I've got this big sounding board around me that means that I'm in trouble. I got guys who help me, um, and yeah, I'm super grateful for yeah, these wow. guys. So, what what uh, things do you track with Dean? Do you do like HIV and heart rate and things like that? No, or? we don't do that. Um, pretty pretty simple. We track sleep, yeah. body weight, uh, mood, uh, level of tiredness, and macros. Okay, and fiber and water. Okay. Yeah. So um, there's not a lot of uh, stuff outside of those big picture things. Like I've heard a lot of good stuff about tracking heart rate and tracking all sorts of things like that. Yeah. Um, but we haven't looked into that. We track a bit of steps at some point. Okay. Uh, just to make sure I'm not sitting on my ass. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, outside of that, we don't we don't track anything like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, does he get what what stress management stuff? Does he like okay, your weight's gone up, your sleep's not as good. What's going on? Like do this or. What I think kind of stuff do you do? The the biggest reason we track all those things is to have a level of regulation mm-hmm. and the level of accountability if things do change, right? So if macros are the same, uh, accountability to food has been the same, uh, and it seems that mood has changed and sleep has gone down, well, you can probably point in that direction and say this could be the reason. Um, and so... The, the, the management is fix it you know the management is get more sleep um, yeah. you know if sleep's all good and, and, and supposedly macros are all good and weight changes well you screwed up your tracking or something you know mm. um, or you know like there's a big questionnaire I fill in every week which is you know asks is there more or less noticeable activity in a week um as many variables as we can have under our belt to know why certain things occurred so that when we need to, to, to change weight for comp, we know what to do, when to do it, you know? Um, so more recently, I've come down from my really big intake of five to 6,000 cows. <laughs> thousand, I, thousand games of cows? <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. Um, and I've pulled it down and I did literally a 10-day cut. Yeah. Lost almost three kilos wow which would have been a lot of glycogen and water yeah yeah um, but genuinely I think I actually lost a pretty decent amount of body fat in that time like if you look at photo comparisons um, and now we're pretty much bopping between comp weight which is 94 kilos and 96 kilos on the high and low days of the week in, in my intake so I'll do a couple of days at four or five hundred grams of carbs and that'll get me down to weight and then I'll do a couple of days up at 700 or so, and that'll get me up a kilo or two because of glycogen and also okay. uptake yeah. and food and gut volume and all the rest. And these are the things that we've been able to look data and plot things out and have a lot of variables so that when it comes to comp week, it'll be cool, three days here, three days there, comp weight done. Yeah. No water manipulation, no sauna, all the classic stuff you hear powerlifters do, none of that. Just really smart manipulation of food based on the fact that I've been tracking for the last two years with Dean. Yeah, and you've learned so much from all the other competitions. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Luckily for me, weight's never been a massive thing in comps because I've always gone for the weight class up. Yeah. So I started my powerlifting comps uh, weighing 88 kilos in the 93 class. Wow. So I spent two years filling that out. And then when powerlifting Australia split from the IPF and made the WP, mm. we changed the weight classes and now it's 94. Okay. So I've got heaps of room. Yeah, what do yeah. you weigh now? Uh, again, I've come into out of this off season. Peak weight was a hundred. Yeah, so I'm a different man now. Uh, <laughs> peak weight was a hundred, uh, but I'm back down to ninety four to ninety five. Oh, okay, so yeah. you don't really need to do anything. Nothing. Okay. Nothing, nothing at all. Uh, it'll be when I'm when I'm like a raw ninety eight, ninety nine. That'll be hard. Mm. Like when I'm like 
98, 99 in the condition that I'm in now, which yeah. is like, I'm not, I'm not super lean, but I'm certainly, it's certainly not someone you call fat. I'm in a position where I can still see, still see the abs, still got a definition, like, which is not that common for powerlifting physique, you know, like an ideal powerlifting physique. Like the ideal powerlifting physique is probably a Shredded. little, like, probably, it's, it's probably like as much, as much muscle mass as you can attain with a healthy level of body fat mm. for the joints. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. probably the ideal yeah. for recovery. Oh yeah, you, know, you look I, at I the world say. records for most, apart from like the 160 kilo people, and they're all like shredded. They're just like they're look all, amazing. Yeah, they're all they're all, they're all big guys. That, that again, I'd say they probably hold that slightly higher level of body fat to what you'd say like is shredded. Yeah, know? they're like, not bodybuilder. They're, yeah, they're, they're shredded they're, glutes. They're lean. <laughs> they're lean, but again, they're in that sort of position where you're like, okay, you're like he could lose a few kilos oh, without yeah. too much trouble. Yeah, but he's lean. Yeah. that's kind of like the way I describe it as long winded as that is yeah. um, and I'm not there yet as a 97, 98 kilo person I'm, I'm a bit more thick some would say <laughs> thick with two C's <laughs> with a Q capital Q you know like that's yeah definitely where I'm at oh mum's giving me a call okay. um, which is fine um, get it on the podcast <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah that's, that's definitely an observation is that I've got a bit of room to move still within this weight class which is yeah. great um, and I'll continue to seek that that growth in the off-season periods that I take. Okay. Yeah. So what? What's the, is that like? Your next? You want to put more size on? Yeah. Or, so yeah. I think that you know, for me, uh, it's about making myself the best lifter I can be between the age of twenty-five and thirty. Mm-hmm. Like right now, I'm in a very much a develop, developmental phase of my time in powerlifting. If I want to be in powerlifting and be the best powerlifter I can be by the peak age period, which is like twenty-eight to thirty-five. Yeah. Then I've got a lot of groundwork to do. Whilst the testosterone's naturally high, yeah. whilst I'm younger and I'm, I'm eating a lot, and I've got the time to do that, I yeah. have kids. I don't right. So right now it's about building as much muscle as possible in the right areas, getting as strong as I can, um, and making the most of of my training year, and not spending too too much of that time in comp phases because re- realistically, comp phases are the least productive. Yeah. You showcase the work and you refine it's like sharpening it's like when you got a piece of clay you're kind of finishing the final mm, details yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas in, in the big hypertrophy phases you're getting that big block of clay and you're cutting big bits off and you're really molding big picture stuff um, which is far more beneficial to the long term you know scenario um, but again it all has its place you've got to be competing to know what a comp's like and yeah. to have that peaking strategy involved and also to be developing that uh, exposure to the top mm. end oh, you, yeah. you've got to have that yeah. uh, the idea is having a balance where you're doing more of the work than the refinement stuff okay. you know that's what I'd like well, so yeah after this comp it'll be six six months till Oceana's which yeah. will give me a good opportunity to do three to four months of bodybuilding again then after Oshi's I think we'll take another big break uh, maybe do the Nats next year but I think there's a discussion to be had around whether mm. that's worthwhile or whether taking a developmental year yeah, well. would not bother me doing a local comp in that time Nats the next year aim to win yeah. Worlds after that yeah. would be my long term plan yeah so how does that work with the because Australia like split from the IPF yeah. if you compete nas- like internationally yeah are you qualified to go straight into IPF, or do you need to like do no, some so, registration? So, or? so, so, pretty much, if I'm in, if, I, if I'm within Powerlifting Australia, IPF Walter is not on the cards. Okay. If I went and joined APU, Australian Powerlifting Union, which is the new formed uh, IPF affiliate, then I could go to IPF Worlds, and I had that choice, mm. and I chose to stay with PA, and I chose to keep my lifters uh, in a stable uh, environment. Uh, for the record, I actually um, emailed APU and asked them about some information because I was interested at one yeah, point yeah. because it was I was on the fence. They never replied, uh, so okay. that 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 sealed my decision. <laughs> yeah, uh, and that was pretty disappointing to be honest because I was pretty much saying, "Hey, look, I've got I've got twenty lifters that are within PA. Um, I I am capable of going to IPF Worlds as a junior. I was that was my big goal. Wow, yeah, it all split up." I made the choice not to go to Worlds and to stay loyal to PA and to keep my lifters again in a stable federation because um, APU had no comps planned at that point. Uh, and since then, they're, 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 they're doing great. They're doing, they're doing their thing. Um, PA still run 50% of the comps in Australia across all federations. So we're still by far the biggest the biggest, um, biggest affiliate. Um, so now my attention is towards growing and supporting world powerlifting. Mm. And particularly the drug standards, the drug testing standards, because um, you know we're seeing a lot of lifters moving around different federations. We're seeing some 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 lifters, um, you know, getting popped for drugs um, 
uh, within within PA um, and you know getting moved on, uh, and it's just something that was a big ticket item when it comes to PA and the IPF and APU, um, is that a lot of a lot of lifters who are staying with PA, who are the better lifters within PA, um, are there because they know how stringently we test okay. um, against against our PED users. Um, and I got a lot of mates who compete in other federations that are not regulated, and I have full respect for mm. people oh, yeah. who are, who are well, it's part of natural or not. Everything, yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's all cool with me. It's more so the the, the cheating standpoint within, oh, within yeah. federations that do test. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I know a couple of people who have been caught, and I just I couldn't have less respect mm. for people who decide to compete in tested feds on gear. Um, that really sucks, but that's a big that's a big aspect because I see um, Robert Wilkes working so hard to keep. Um, PA as clean as possible. That that to me is more important than uh, seeking the, the the best competition. You know, because the the right the right um, people and the the top clean athletes will come to the federations that are regulating the mm, best. Yeah. That's that's what I think. Yeah. And so the more that we can support WP in the next three to five years, I think that the the world standard and the international standard for WP will become extremely competitive. Okay. And I hope we see a bit of a turn in the tide. Um, but it'll all be a test of time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Very focused on the future, like the journey, not the destination. That's I it, love man. That. I've been loving that saying. Yeah, big time. And uh, on that note, that's about an hour. Okay. Thanks so much for your time, Matty. Oh, dude, pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, we got through quite a bit. Yeah, where can they find you? Um, Instagram's main point of contact at the moment, guys. So underscore Matt Bartholomew. Hit me up there. And if you ever need any, any help with it, when it comes to powerlifting or any SNC stuff, Hit me up. Um, I've been a bit on the YouTubes, but haven't been on there yep. for a little while. So there's a little bit of content floating if you want to check that out. Um, but yeah, touch base if you want, and I'll catch you guys soon. Yeah. Thanks for watching, guys, or listening, or yeah. Peace. <laughs> See ya. Thanks, guys.